So this is Ross, who is the Chief Product Officer for Cloud Elements. And Cloud Elements are basically a fintech company that specialize in API integration. integration. And when I asked you what you want to be famous for, you can tell everybody. <laughs> Uh, I've got a mic. Yep. I'm all set. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. I can go now. I was just <laughs> killing time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we're, uh, I'm, I'm the chief product officer at a company called Cloud Elements. We're an API integration platform. Um, we've been focusing a lot in the world of uh, fintech and financial services, but I'm not going to tell you really anything more about that today. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the opportunity that we're seeing as the... Uh, the open banking movement starts to take hold uh, across um, various uh, uh, regions. We've done that bit already. Um, so, you know, I think with there's, there's something like 50 or so various um, jurisdictions around the world that are now pursuing um, an open banking strategy in some form. Um, at least half of those are um, being uh, forced to do something uh, via regulatory mandate. Um, and and uh, so that, that's definitely, you know, creating some opportunity. I think as, as we heard uh, from uh, one of the speakers yesterday morning, though, re re regulators aren't out uh, to create markets. That's not their job. They're responding um, to um, market dynamics and trying to create uh, standards and opportunity that can be applied as broadly as possible. So about half of us sit in this, in this bucket. Um, uh, the, the, as I said, there's a lot of different things happening around the world in this, in this domain. But um, there is also an opportunity here, right? It isn't just that we're being forced to do something as an industry. Um, it's that there's actually real business value to be derived from this movement. Um, and that's what I really wanted to dig into a little bit today, talk about some of the use cases and, and real opportunities for revenue um, that uh, organizations face. Um, perhaps first of all, though, you know, th there's definitely risk for, for not participating here. Um, I, I think as we look at the, the landscape, um, banks are very well aware of the competitive threats that they see, especially perhaps in the world of retail banking. Um, but uh, beyond that, right, there's quite a bold statement from our friends at Gartner. They say that um, by 2030, four out of five financial services organizations um, will no longer exist or be rendered totally irrelevant. Uh, I think this is, a, again, a, a pretty bold statement, but it is representative of um, the changing market dynamics for sure. So um, regulatory mandate, really just the tip of the iceberg, I think. Uh, beyond that, we can see that there is a variety of opportunity ahead of us. There is an ecosystem of partners. There's new types of use cases. And, and, um, and that's why, as I said, I want to talk about uh, some today. I also wanted to talk about, though, the, the differences between corporate banking opportunities and, and the world of retail banking. Quite often, especially um, in the world of PSD2, we talk about um, account information and payment initiation in the context of consumer-facing use cases and, and retail banking services. And I think there's um, obviously a lot of value there. It's increasingly uh, a very competitive space. But um, corporate or commercial banking um, has a whole raft of opportunity as well, and that's what I want to talk about. Looking at um, you know, the, the statistics here, right? this is from um, the McKinsey Global Banking Report this year. Um, the, there's a huge amount of revenue that sits in the world of commercial banking, transaction banking. Uh, for, for many organizations, that's where the lion's share of the revenue exists. Um, and uh, even though uh, perhaps the uh, return on uh, equity isn't quite uh, where they'd like it to be in some, in some cases, there's definitely reason to focus effort and energy here. And, and this sort of the gray box at the top um, in this report is really uh, uh, indicating where uh, the big tech and fintech uh, uh, companies are, are attacking or, or playing most commonly, right? That's where the, the majority of, of their um, investment in terms of new product development exists today. Um, so I think there's, there's sort of then two pieces of the puzzle here. One, um, there's less competitive threat uh, in the world of commercial banking, and there's an opportunity to improve um, the ROE. 
And, and, and so I think, again, this is another reason why looking at some of the use cases in this domain is, uh, is most interesting. As a good example of this, Deutsche Bank um, talked about some of their evolving strategy um, earlier this year. I think sometime during the summer, um, they announced a pretty uh, significant change in how they were going to do business going forward. They created an entirely new division um, that uh, is the, the corporate bank at, at Deutsche Bank. Um, for a little bit of context, right, they process somewhere in the region of one trillion euro per day. So they're not a small bank by any means. Um, and, uh, you know, when they look at um, the, the performance of their corporate banking products, um, they're really looking to increase uh, the effectiveness of, of that business, um, turning ROE from 8% in 2018 to a target of 15% um, by 2022. And so pretty aggressive goals, and we've seen um, banks in other parts of the world um, say these things too and, and haven't quite got there. I think Barclays have sort of backed away, HSBC have backed away from some of the things they've said recently in terms of growing um, uh, that part of their business. And ultimately then, um, to, to achieve some of the, this change, they're going to spend uh, 13 billion dollars, or 13 billion euro, I should say, um, over the next few years in order to transform this part of their business. So, Again, this is uh, entirely focused in the world of, of corporate banking. Um, a little bit more context about, uh, about cloud elements perhaps can be found in this, in this report. We surveyed a number of uh, banking leaders, digital banking product leaders um, across Europe uh, recently and compiled all of that uh, research into um, the State of Open Banking report for 2019. Um, if you hit that link, you'll be able to download it, um, and I'll show you this slide again at the very end in case you don't get a chance to grab that, uh, that link. One of the things that we asked was um, looking at you know, the opportunity in front of you, um, you know, how, how important do you see APIs and API-based integration and uh, you know, specifically the world of API integration in open banking? Um, you know, where does that rank in terms of priority and importance to your business? And so the numbers here are quite clear, right? People are saying, uh, you know, nine out of ten respondents are absolutely this is a key thing for us. Um, and and that, that's uh, excellent news, sure, um, but then that has to translate into actual strategy and, and new products. And so um, that's what I'm going to talk about. So... Um, when we sort of dug into specific use cases, you can see that improving innovation, better B2B products, and streamlining business processes all rank really highly. And I think you could probably summarize all of that then into, three, well, maybe there's more than three categories. I'm going to talk about three categories um, today. And the first of those is uh, the world of corporate payments. Um, I think the, as, as we look at the, the payments landscape today, it varies obviously quite a bit from one geography to another. Um, in the US, for example, um, still north of 50% of all corporate payments are um, via check uh, because that's the least friction way that they have available to them right now. I know that that's not true in, in, every, in every jurisdiction and the um, you know, move towards faster payments and real-time payments in various uh, geographies is starting to change that. But one of the gaps or, or problems um, with the, the real-time payments infrastructure is often the lack of, of metadata associated with the transaction, right? So not having um, the invoice um, that you're paying, for example, and that's why um, checks are still very effective in the US. So, so this space, I think, is ripe for disruption, and there's, there's an opportunity to do um, a bunch of interesting things here. Um, in the Capgemini World Payments Report, uh, just demonstrating that it's the other people that are smart and I'm just repeating what they say. Um, the, the, in the Capgemini report this year, um, one of the guys from uh, uh, the Bank of the West in, in, uh, in the USA um, was basically saying that API strategy and integration of fintech platforms in middle and back office operations are the biggest value drivers for corporate payments. In other words, that end-to-end -end process, being able to integrate right the way through into corporate systems, ERP and accounting uh, in the back office, is really what makes this move towards real-time payments and, and new payment uh, API capabilities much more interesting. And that will start to drive 
adoption, and adoption has obviously been something that's been quite slow in a, in a variety of areas. So I have some examples here. Um, Western Union, I will first of all say, I'm gonna show you a bunch of logos and companies here and talk about some of their products. Some of them are customers of Cloud Elements, some are not, I'm not distinguishing between, between them here. I just wanted to show you some uh, interesting companies that are um, doing, uh, building new products in each of these areas. So Western Union, um, the business solutions uh, side of Western Union has a new product called Edge. Basically, a end-to-end -end payments platform connecting buyers and sellers and allowing you to um, integrate tightly with the accounting and ERP packages that you use, right? Removing that swivel chair um, need um, when uh, making payments for, for um, various things. Um, and so that, that idea of, um, you know, an integrated AP process or AR process um, or straight through processing, I think, is, uh, is very interesting. We talked a little bit about this um, in other sessions over the past two days as well. Um, and uh, another good example here uh, are the folks at Access Pay, right? They're, they're, they're driving uh, an entirely new way for organizations to manage payments, trying to get away from all of those manual processes. Something like 75% of the effort uh, involved in, in processing payments for, los, for most corporates is manual data entry that's just not necessary. And uh, we have technology, or technology solutions to solve these problems today, and they're just not widely adopted yet. So corporate payments, I think, represents a massive opportunity, um, and, uh, and we'll start to see more and more of this. The other area, um, and this is sort of quite a generic and, and large bucket of, of use cases for sure, but if I think about corporate treasury and unified cash management solutions, um, there's again a massive amount of opportunity here. Um, I, uh, I like this product, uh, Travata, from uh, a small company in the US. They've been uh, partnering with, uh, with JPMC uh, to provide this uh, real-time cash management dashboard allowing you to collect a unified view of all of your uh, accounting and cash and liquidity positions effectively. So multi-bank integration, um, it, providing uh, real-time access into um, cash positions regardless of where you're banking, um, but also providing um, API access, real-time API access into your accounting um, or treasury management uh, software also. Uh, and, and then creating this holistic view of what's going on. So multi-bank cash management, I think, is really key. Um, for most organizations, they bank with you know, 10 or 12 separate banks, um, especially those uh, that are multinational organizations. So um, being able to create a single pane of glass, if you like, um, that, that spans all of those banking organizations is, is incredibly helpful um, for, for treasurers or, or CFOs. Ultimately, what they're being asked for today is a way to predict um, what's going to happen next, right? A more effective forecasting for the business. Rather than simply being able to tell you what happened yesterday, um, they need to be able to predict what's going to happen tomorrow. And the only way to do that is to provide um, better API-based access to all of the environments that we interact with um, on a daily basis. And it also allows us um, to you know, create a real-time view, uh, and that uh, can be transformative for many businesses, knowing um, what uh, cash on hand looks like at a particular point in time uh, is incredibly effective. It's, you know, and I'm saying like, better than just once a day, real-time, not uh, nightly or um, weekly in some cases. Another example in this space is uh, FX trading and uh, being able to um, uh, service the FX uh, foreign exchange market more effectively. Good example here of perhaps things that we could do in the future is, you know, understand where, uh, you know, your customers are using competitors' products. So if I could see that um, one of my customers has completed a foreign exchange uh, transaction um, with one of my competitors, I'll know that perhaps I could offer them a better rate or certainly try to understand why they chose to process that particular transaction with a competitor rather than with, with your institution. Um, again, the sorts of uh, business opportunity, revenue opportunity that exists here 
um, wouldn't be possible without the, the openness that we're starting to see in this domain. Um, you know, there, there's certainly an, an argument to say that, uh, you know, the people that are uh, really the owners of that data, right, the various corporates that are processing those transactions um, may be less interested in sharing that information. But ultimately, if they're um, able to get a better deal um, going forward, there's, there's definitely interest. <clears throat> And then the, the final area that I wanted to talk about is, uh, is lending and trade finance. Um, the, the world of, of corporate lending, certainly in the domain of small business lending, um, I think has seen a huge amount of disruption um, in, in almost every jurisdiction. Um, I for, for the, in the US, for example, the, um, the banks have, um, you know, been talking for a long time about servicing small business, and it's, it's often said that you know, small business is the backbone of the US economy, and I think we say that here in the UK too. Um, the, the reality is uh, the processes that have existed here in servicing those types of customers just aren't um, fit for purpose, right? I want to be able to um, interact with a lender quickly and easily, have them um, make a decision quickly. I don't want a paper-based process. I don't want to wait for weeks at a time. And so, again, better integration and better access to data can uh, change the experience that um, these organizations have. Um, trade finance is another, another key area. So you may have seen that HSBC um, launched and announced earlier this year that they would be exposing a variety of new trade finance APIs, um, the first of which is a bank guarantee API. I think uh, Standard and ING are the first um, organizations um, leveraging this, and, and there's a, a lot of interest uh, across um, the, the banking sector in, in this capability. So basically making it possible to um, execute um, bank guarantees via API, letter of credit via an API in the future, um, rather than um, some of the, the legacy processes um, via SWIFT, for example, that have existed in the past. So this is uh, an area, again, that I think um, will start to transform the nature of cross-border trade. Um, and uh, um, the, uh, HSBC promises that there's, uh, there's a bunch more to come. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this idea of transforming the lending experience in general, I think, is, is, an, is another key area. Uh, companies in the world of receivables backed lending um, is uh, uh, becoming increasingly common. Many organizations um, uh, rely heavily on receivables backed um, lending or factoring um, just to, to run their day-to-day -day business. Um, and again, making this quick and easy is really important. Providing um, integration into uh, treasury products and accounting products in order to find a real-time perspective of receivables um, makes it possible for, for banks and lenders to make decisions fast, and that's what these um, companies ultimately need. Um, and uh, we've, we've talked a fair amount about the world of um, real-time credit worthiness and credit assessment. Some of the examples here, um, Silicon Valley Bank are, are using um, uh, integration into accounting packages to to understand your, your credit worthiness, and Internex is a, a good example of a sort of re receivable-based lending. So I guess ultimately with all of this, right, what I wanted to highlight is that there is a huge amount of opportunity here in the world of open banking. Um, it's it's uh, not just something we're being forced to do. There's real money to be had. And um, even though we talk a lot about um, the world of, of retail banking, um, corporate banking is, uh, for, for many, um, really where uh, the lion's share of potential profit uh, exists. And uh, so I just wanted to highlight some of the interesting things that are happening um, and, uh, and share some of those uh, product examples. And remind you again that if you want access to uh, that report, um, feel free to hit this link. Thank you very much. And uh, I've actually read that report, and what I'll do is I'll share it on the Open Banking Excellence uh, LinkedIn page as well. Thank you. It is a really decent report. Thank you. Um, have anybody got any questions for Ross before? Um, thank you. If we can get the mic up there. Thought there would be some. And I'm hoping it's around lending, which is what I think is going to be the next game changer. And it certainly is what we heard from the speaker before. Hello. 
I'm Could you Narayan give your here. name and uh, company name, please? I'm Narayan here. I'm from Wells Fargo. Hi there. And I've been waiting for somebody to talk on corporate banking. <laughs> well, well, I'm done. glad. You know, I, I had a feeling that maybe we would be quite retail-oriented this, uh, this conference. So uh, yeah. I'm glad I had something for you. Yeah, thanks for bringing up some of these points which are important for us. Uh, while you did mention something about multibank cash concentration and liquidity options and opportunities, uh, some of these things, I believe, they may be better served right now by swift based standard messaging because Though we have a lot of opportunities because of open banking in API, there has to be certain level of standardization. Otherwise, yep. to reach all the multi-banks, it's going to be a challenge. What's your thought on that? Yeah, and I, you know, I think that, that is, it is fair to say that um, the standardization in, uh, in the SWIFT domain, so GPI, um, ISO 20022, um, is you know, providing a good platform for, on, upon which um, existing banks can start to um, uh, build new and interesting products that will work together seamlessly. Um, however, it does perhaps keep some of the, um, you know, the, the fintech community out in the cold a little bit, right? Because there is uh, a much higher barrier to entry there if we're gonna rely on, on those capabilities. But I, I do agree that that's, that's a good foundation um, and uh, certainly in terms of banks working together to build new things. So, you know, the U.S. is a good example here of, you know, being in a position where a small number of banks can transform the landscape um, in, in, in the U.S. market, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, the SWIFT-based uh, capabilities, I think, are, are key for that. Great question. Thank you. Can we just take one more before we have a break? Is there one more question? Well, that has been fascinating. Please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Ross from Cloud Elements. And I'll make sure everybody sees that report. Thank you.